Christmas. We would like to thank you for coming out tonight to worship together. And uh, I pray that uh, you'll be blessed by the message. And uh, pray that the Lord would be blessed as well. Uh, we're going to be all over the place tonight. Uh, Misty has assured me that we have until 11.45 p.m., so make yourselves comfortable if you need a water break. Um, that's what she said. So you take it up with her. Uh, before we pray, I would like to kind of introduce you to the message that uh, the Lord has put on my heart. So Pastor Scott asked me about three months ago if I would preach this. And uh, that is way too much time for me because I had three months to, to go over this and then to re-go over it and to throw some stuff aside and then grab other stuff. And, you know, even tonight, 30 minutes before I left the house, I'm, I'm discarding stuff, I'm crossing stuff out. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm writing in chapters that I'm going to read, and, and we just don't have that kind of time tonight. So, um, I told my class a couple weeks ago to keep a couple different words in mind. Um, do you guys remember what any of those words were? All right. Courage is one of them, illumination is another, and faith is the third. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, I couldn't get courage or illumination, uh, a biblical definition of those, but um, according to Google, courage, the ability to do something, that frightens one. And then illumination is simply to light. Um, so those were the three words that the Lord put on my heart for this message. And I'm hoping that, that he will tie them in for you. Um, now, I, I, you know, pastor's got a difficult job because he stands up here every week. And um, he speaks to a, a, a group of people that, that some don't believe at all in Christ. Uh, some probably use his name as a curse word. Some uh, have been believers for quite some time. Some believe in his name only. Some have been saved for a very long time. And he has to be able to uh, put together a message and speak to everyone's hearts. And I know that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But it's still a difficult task. So today, I'm, tonight I'm going to ask you guys. Um, well, first I want to introduce four different people to you. I was looking at illustrations and I'm going over them, going over them, and, and, and I thought, you know what, I'd rather make this personal. So I'm going to introduce you to four people uh, tonight that are men from my past. Um, so the first one, his name is Dave. Dave and I go all the way back to about second grade. And uh, I moved out here, uh, you know, after I got out of the Marines. And, um, well, I got baptized right here. Um, and about, this was about, I don't know, 
it's 27, I guess, 27. So Dave and I hadn't spoken in years, because we hadn't spoken since high school. Um, but when I went back to Iowa, I thought it would be a good idea to talk to Dave about the Lord. So I, I just asked him, um, you know, have you ever put any thought into the Lord? And he shut me right down and said he did not want to be saved. And that was before I even, I didn't even bring up anything else. That was the first thing out of his mouth, so I respected his wishes. And then, um, you know, we haven't spoken since. Um, it's, it's been quite some time. Uh, so that was Dave. The second one is Ray. Ray and I have been friends for approximately 23 years. Ray is this giant of a man. He's a good friend of mine. He was raised Catholic. He, uh, we used to carpool together. And I was driving, so I got to do the talking and drive as slow as I wanted. So, uh, yeah, well, that's what it gets for having me drive. So we're, we're driving back and forth, and I'm driving him off at his house, and it's about, about this time of the year, actually. And um, I asked him if, um, what, what his thoughts were on the Lord, if he knew the Lord. And so I told him how to be saved, and, and um, he said he had to go. So, so I let him out of the truck. He got in his house. He said, I'll think about it tonight. So then the next day, I was all, I was all over the place that night. I was so excited. I was praying for him. And uh, he comes back the next day with tears in his eyes, chin quivering, and he said uh, he didn't believe that you needed to be born again in order to be saved. So shortly thereafter, we got separated. He went his way. I went my way. We haven't spoken about it since. Third guy. Third one is Tim. Now, Tim's an interesting character. Tim, <laughs> Tim threatened my life. Tim, uh, Tim and I were at work one day. And uh, he splashed me with his water bottle. And so I took my soda over to his service truck, and I, I went to dump it. I was just joking. I wasn't actually going to do it. But he didn't take it that way. So he pinned my, my arm in his service truck door and pulled out a screwdriver and told me he was going to kill me. And there was nothing I could do about it. So it had to be the Lord. Uh, I mean, I know this guy was serious, but I said, you know, you have no power over me except that that the Lord would give you. And he stopped. He opened the door up and, and let me go. Fast forward three years, I hadn't spoken to him, obvious, for obvious reasons. And uh, he shows up at my work site. And I'm doing my best to be polite and just, you know. And uh, he says, uh, he said something about, about money. And I said, well, you know, it's all the Lord's anyway, right? Just... Just a, uh, just a comment. And, and I saw in his eyes, he was shaken. And I mean shaken. He was shaken to the core. And it was just a simple comment. That, that was the end of the discussion. He got in his service truck and he left. I haven't seen him since. And the fourth guy, the fourth guy, he was my best friend. And some of you have heard about this guy since probably about 2014, if you've been around that long. And I got to witness to him. He was my best friend in high school. And, uh, well, we became like brothers. We were, we could finish each other's sentences. He was, uh, we were very close. He, uh, he ended up getting brain cancer at 29 years old. And uh, I got to see him on the last day of his life. And uh, I was, it's actually the first time that I've ever prayed for somebody. And I got an audible answer from God, like, like he was right, right here. And um, he just kept saying, rest assured, over and over and over, rest assured, rest assured, rest assured. And so, I'm like, all right, so I fly back to Iowa, and I didn't know that this was his last day. I thought he was doing better, because God told me, rest assured, right? So uh, I get to the hospital in Iowa City, and, uh, and there he is laying, laying in the hospital bed, and his mom stopped me before I went in and said, I don't think he's going to make it through the night. So, I go in the hospital room, and uh, he's got this tube sticking out of his mouth, and uh, 29 years old, couldn't speak, face was all red, vein bulging out of his forehead, because it was like he, I woke him up, first of all, or his mom woke him up, and, and, and it was like he had something he needed to say, but he couldn't speak, because he had a tube coming out of his mouth. So, I 
prayed right there. I said, you know, Lord, help me with this, because this is not what I thought I was walking into. It was a complete shock to me. Lord, you told me rest assured. I thought this, this guy was going to make it, right? Like, I even, I even told his parents before I walked in the, in the hospital room that they're like, I don't think he's going to make it. I said, no, don't worry about it. The Lord told me rest assured. Jamie's going to be fine. They're like, I don't think so. I'm like, God told me rest assured. I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to be okay. So anyway, so this is important because, well, some of you have never heard this, probably most of you. Um, I asked him if he knew the Lord Tuesday of that week. And he said, no, you know, we were taught in school. We came from monkeys. I said, that's not the truth, man. I'll talk to you on Friday when I get there. So he had a three-day period of waiting and processing what I had just said. Friday rolls around. I said, Jamie, this is the gospel. This is Jesus Christ. This is the only way you're going to get to heaven. It doesn't look good. I don't know if you have tomorrow. Do you want to pray with me? I'll pray out loud. You pray in your head. You squeeze my hand if you want to pray. And then when we're done praying, squeeze my hand and, and let me know you prayed with me. So he squeezed my hand. So we prayed. I had a little pocket Bible Pastor Brown gave me. We prayed. He squeezed my hand. I left there knowing that my friend was going to be in heaven that night. God told me rest assured, right? So I got to go and speak at his funeral. Um, I told his family I would do that if, if uh, or I would be his pallbearer if they would let me speak. So I got to go out in front of a group probably twice this size and all these people that knew me in high school and tell them about the decision that Jamie made and how I knew he was going to be in heaven. Or he was in heaven at that point. And uh, so I don't know who that affected and who it didn't. All that to be said, have you ever wondered why some people flat out reject the gospel? Flat out reject Christ? Some people are uh, convicted, but they just don't make that jump. And some people take a hold and grab and go. You see these missionaries that are, are you know, so excited to be serving the Lord, and, and then others that just put the Lord on a back burner. Have you ever, have you ever sat and thought about why that is? I mean, maybe, maybe you can identify with one of those four guys. If not, you can at least maybe know somebody that can. You probably had a picture in your head of somebody as I was speaking about those four men. Well, that's what I've been thinking about for the last three months. So I'm hoping that by the end of this message tonight, uh, at four hours and 45 minute mark, you will know why I have peace that surpasses all understanding. Because at the end of this, that, that's, that is the main goal. I want you guys to know that somebody else believes. Somebody has put their faith and trust in the word of God and understands that this is truth, and you can stand on every single word. Okay? All right. So let's go, let's go all the way back to Isaiah. Actually, before we do that, I'd like to pray. If you would bow your heads with me and close your eyes, we'll go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for each one that decided, made a choice to come out and worship you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for each one in attendance. I pray, God, that you would illuminate their hearts and their minds, soften them, shape them, reveal yourself to them in a way that they did not know coming in today. I pray, Lord, that you would save every single soul in here tonight. If they don't know you, convict their hearts and help them to make that choice. Make the decision to follow you and to love you. Jesus, we know this is, this is the true Christmas message. Without you, there is none of this. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us into this truth tonight. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Isaiah, all the way back, approximately seven to 800 years before Christ, I don't know. Some of these, thank you, some of these 
I've got a lot. Some of these are just bullet points. We're going we're gonna, to, we're like on an airplane. We're going to take off. We're going to hit it about 10,000 feet. We're going to look down. We're going to hit a couple bullet points for you to have in your memory bank. And then we're going to make it personal. Okay? So Isaiah, all the way back about seven, 800 years before Christ, prophesies about Jesus Christ. In chapter 7, verse 14, he writes, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The reason, well, let's go to 9 first. Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. I'm going to be flying through these because I was only kidding about the 1145 thing. Misty did not tell me 11.45. She said 11.30 tops. Verse 6 of chapter 9 reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Why is this important? Well, this, there, there's many reasons why this is important. But, but just off the top of my head, the first thing that came to my mind when I read this was, if this was not, uh, if, if this didn't take place exactly as it said in Isaiah, then Isaiah's prophecy would either not have happened yet or it would be a lie. And I don't believe either one of those two are, are accurate. I believe this is truth, and Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this prophecy. Therefore, he had to have been born of a virgin. All right, that to be said. Also, Isaiah calls him the mighty God. That's deity. That's deity. All right? Uh, next. 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 Uh, Acts, chapter 7, verses 55 and 56. Is that what I have there? I'm not seeing it yet. That's not what I have there. Okay, so let's go, I'm sorry, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, 20 and 21. I was a little worried I wasn't going to have these tied in with that. All right, so Revelation chapter 3, Verses 20 and 21. This is important because all I'm doing here is showing you where Christ is at now. Okay? So, so now we know that according to Isaiah, he is the Son of God. He is deity. And now we're going to look at a couple different passages to show you where he's at. First is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is Jesus speaking. That's why it's in red letters. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. All right, that's the first one. And the second one is Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, this is telling us where he's at. You know, the courage thing, I, uh, I happened to skip that, and I wanted to go back to that for a second. You know, it takes courage to put your faith and your trust believing in something that you cannot see or someone that you cannot see. That takes courage. So courage, what I read to you according to Google, isn't exactly how I define courage. Courage, courage to me is what you do in the face of fear. When you're, when you're afraid, and, and you, it's what you do when you're afraid, right? So how that ties in with faith is... Uh, it goes hand in hand in, in the Word of God. Um, it takes faith in something or someone to have courage. And it takes courage to put your faith and trust in someone you can't see. Why? Because uh, 
If you're in a threatening situation and you act on that, you have to put your faith in something that you can, cannot see, right? That, that you have strength from coming from somewhere or something, right? My strength, I recognize, comes from Jesus Christ. So, so when I'm put in that situation, like when Tim pinned my arm in the door, my strength comes from Christ. I, I, didn't, I didn't plan to say that to him when he did that. It, it, just, it just came out. And, and it, apparently it was enough for him to step back and say, wait a minute, this, this isn't right. Right? So the reason I can say these things to you is because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that's not like a puffed up thing like, look at me. That's when you admit that, when you have done that, that's a very humbling thing. That's a humbling thing. Because you're recognizing that there is a bigger God than you. There, there is something in the universe that is bigger than you are. Right? And the Bible tells us all the way back uh, in Genesis 1, right? We were talking with the college and career. So I'm doing this study, and I'm, you know, weeks ago, and, and it, it came to me like, all of a sudden I realized that, you know, there's some things in the Bible where you're like, you just kind of, you're hesitant on taking that next step. Like, I'm praying for somebody else at this time. And all of a sudden God says, how is your faith? And it's funny how God does that, because that's how he speaks to me. Whenever, I, whenever I'm talking to him about something else, oh, help somebody do this or whatever, right? He always says, well, let's talk about you, right? So, so for me, he took me all the way back to in the beginning, God created. So in the beginning, God created. And I'm like, okay, well, it's, I've always said I just believe it, just like that. Because it's in the beginning, God created it, it's the beginning of the Bible. But when you really start to think about it, what happened before that? I mean, that's like bigger than any of our minds can comprehend. Like, in the beginning, with God there is no time, right? Like, he just always was. As we're going to read in John in a minute, so was Christ. He just always was. So Genesis, in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created, I'm thinking, Lord, I've never, I've never actually put a whole lot of thought into that because it blows my mind, and if I'm being quite honest, I'm not too strong there. And do you know what? The reason I'm bringing that up is because this. When I admitted that to him, when, when I verbalized it, I said it out loud. I verbalized it to him. He wasn't like I was expecting. I don't know why. Instead of, you know, shame on you, you rotten sinner. It was, peace flooded me. Peace flooded me. Which is the way God works. It's not like he doesn't know our hearts anyway. It's not like he doesn't know what we know and we don't know. He knows exactly what we know and what we don't know. He just wants us to communicate it with him. That's the God we serve. Without Jesus Christ... We don't have that connection. It has to be through Christ. Let's get to John 1, because I'm really itching to get there. So, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a name that John gives Jesus Christ. He calls him the Word. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. In him was life. Uh, that life, and the, and the life was the light of men. That life we're talking about is eternal life. It's a fulfilled life, too, but it's eternal life. It's a spiritual life. It's not a physical life that we're referring to here, that John's talking about. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This is why when Christians talk to non-Christians, they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. They just don't know. The, and, and they won't know. Until they make the decision. That's just the way it is. They, they can't comprehend Jesus Christ. It's no different than when he was walking around and telling them about himself. They could not comprehend him. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. 
I've got all men uh, underlined there uh, for a reason. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Pastor Brown used to talk about um, how every person has got a little bit of a light, right? And what you do with that light determines how much more light you get. And I always thought that was, that was good, right? Like, but, but I couldn't put an address on it until I was doing this study for this. And I'm like, that's the address that I needed. That's exactly right. It says it right there. Every man has light. Every single person has a little bit of light. And that light that lives on the inside, see, this is the way it works. In Romans, Paul talks about how we can look around and we can see the mountains and we can see the, the trees and we can see all the things that God has created, right? And so when we look at these things, we have within us the ability to say, there has to be something more to this, right? There, there has to be a creator because we have these creations. That's what we're talking about. We all have that light and what we do with that light determines on how much more light we get. Because think about it. God's not going to illuminate you like a, one of these lights up here without, without any sort of obedience. You would be mind blown. You would be walking around like you do. You walk out of this building in the middle of the day and the sun's blaring in the eyes. All you want to do is this. Right? That's the way that would work. So God gives us a little bit of light and then when we make the decision to follow him, we make the decision to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. When we make the decision to be saved from the punishment of our sins, that's the very first step of faith. Without that, there is no, there is no relationship with God. So he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, and the glory as, the only, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it all has to start somewhere, right? You're, you're, everybody in here has got faith in something, right? But faith has to start somewhere. And faith always starts like this. Help. Forgive. Father, please forgive me for my unbelief and help me believe. Without that, there is no faith. There is no communication. Father, forgive me for not believing what you're telling me. This is the Word of God. This is telling us who He is, who Jesus Christ is, what happened on that cross, why He died for our sins. Without that sacrifice, There is no peace. There is no heaven. And there is no fellowship with God. It all has to start with forgive me for my unbelief and help me believe. It takes courage to say that, though. I wonder how many in here are willing to say that. Now, I'm not asking for a show of hands. But I will say this. You will be known by your fruit. If you, can't, if you can't have the courage to ask God to forgive you of your unbelief and help you to believe, well, it's going to show. It's going to show because you won't be able to love others. You won't be able to forgive others. You won't be able to turn away from sin. If, you, if you're not saved from the punishment of your sins by Jesus Christ and Him alone, if you're not saved, you have no power over sin. You have none. You, you can exchange one for the other. I can give you a good example, actually. Um, so I used to smoke. I used to smoke a lot. When I was in the Marines, I smoked like a chimney. And uh, I drank. I drank a lot. Uh, I tried to quit smoking... And I tried to quit drinking. But I couldn't do both. And I couldn't do just one. So I would go from one to the other. And then that didn't work. So then I 
wore the patch, smoked the cigarettes, and drank. It was, it was always something, right? Because that's the way sin works. You're always, it's like, a, I've got several examples, but one is that Spider-Man movie. You ever see that Spider-Man movie where you got Spider-Man and then you got the, the, the Spider-Man in the black costume? You know, where he starts combing his hair a different way? And then there's this scene where he's in this tower and this, uh, the bell rings and this, this uh, alien stuff, you know, hates it. So it starts getting off him and he's trying to shake this stuff off and it's not coming off him and he's, you know, trying to... That's the way sin works. That's exactly the way sin works. You, you get this little bit off and you think you're good and next thing you know... The thing attaches to your leg, and you're walking around with sin, you don't even know. And then all of a sudden, you're wearing this costume of sin, right? That's just the exact same way sin works. And you have absolutely no power to take away that sin on your own if you don't have the Holy Spirit to guide and direct you. If you don't have Jesus Christ to save you from the punishment of your sins and the power of your sins, it, it doesn't work. Um, So I went and uh, I asked Lana to, re, or to sing this little light of mine. And um, I've got a passage for that, actually, that explains it a little bit. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 reads, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For which, I'm sorry, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. I'd like to go back to uh, John, but instead of John, we're going to go to 1 John. Um, and I think... I think we will wrap it up after 1 John. So 1 John 5, 10 specifically. I had down, written down on there uh, 5 through 15, I think. Okay. But we're going to read 10. Verse 10 reads, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What is that record? I'm glad you asked. Go to John, 1 John, rather, 1. Verse 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us, cleanseth, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And lastly, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I wonder, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you only know of Jesus Christ, what we've read tonight? Have you asked him to forgive you of your unbelief and help you to believe? Is your life glorifying to God? Are you where he wants you to be? 
The very first question that you need to ask yourself is, are you saved? Are you saved? Have you been saved from that punishment of your sins? We've all sinned and, and fall short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 says. And Romans 6.23 says the punishment of that sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. That means we're all under the same blanket punishment. And there's nothing we can do about it on our own. Romans 10.9 Romans 10.9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know there's a difference from believing. This is interesting, this uh, confession. Because if you're going to confess something, you have to have it in your brain. Right? So, so the confession part is easy. We go to God and we confess things all the time. Right? Or we go to anybody and we confess things all the time. But confession is easy. Some, some people think that confession is repentance, and that's not the truth. And, and nor is confession enough to get you into heaven. See, I don't remember where I heard it. It might be Pastor Scott. It might have been Pastor Brown. Uh, but I was just talking to a guy the other day. The difference from heaven to hell is 18 inches. From here to here. Because you can have all the head knowledge in the world. You could know this Bible frontwards and backwards. You could... You know every word, but that's not going to get you into heaven. You see? So you have to be able to apply it to your heart. That's why it says, uh, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that's just saying that you have the head knowledge. And then you have to believe in your heart. Well, if you believe in your heart, it's like that little girl in Texas that we've talked about a couple different times. She believed in her heart that it was going to rain when they prayed, so she carried the umbrella. Are you carrying your umbrella? Do you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead? If you do, if you do, then you'll be saved. But guess what? Your actions will follow that. And if you don't believe that, your actions will follow that as well. 10.10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's not enough just to believe in your head. You could have head knowledge all over the world. You could go outside of this building, you could have a thousand people tell you all kinds of things. Criticize the Bible, whatever. But what does God say? What does God say? God says in his word, if you believe in your heart, you'll be saved. The Bible also talks about how people are going to get to heaven and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I never knew you, depart from me. Do you know there's going to be people sitting in this church tonight that aren't going to be in heaven? What a scary thought. You sat through the whole thing. It's not even 1145. You sat through the whole thing. You listened to all this, and you did not apply it to your heart. What's stopping you? I'll tell you. I already know. There's two things that are stopping you. Pride and fear. They go hand in hand. Pride and fear. You're either afraid you're going to be wrong about this, you're afraid Jesus Christ is going to change your life around and have you do things that you don't want to do, or you've got that black Spider-Man suit on full of sin and you don't want to stop. So how do, you, how do you get past this? Where do you go from here? It starts with, God, please forgive me for my unbelief and help me to believe. And then get in your word. One last thing. It talks about the baptism of Jesus in all four of the Gospels. Um, and in three of those, it talks about John baptizing Jesus, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and the Father saying, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. You have all three persons of the Trinity in one spot. That's pretty significant. Not that you don't always. What I'm saying is, is it's, it's recorded in one spot. That's significant because it must mean that God is serious about baptism. Now, baptism's not going to get you into heaven. Only belief in your heart is going to get you into heaven by Jesus Christ. That's it. But baptism is the very first step of obedience. Once you've accepted Jesus Christ, you must be baptized. That's what the Word says.
So I've got three things written down in the front of my Bible, and we'll close. And Jim, where are you at, Jim? Okay. So I'll have Jim come up and give instructions for the candlelight service part of this. But uh, I've got three things written down, and I don't know where they came from. I don't know where I got them from, but they're powerful. They're interesting. So they are this, talking about baptism. Baptism is an oath of loyalty. Baptism is a declaration to both sides as to whose side you are on. And third, baptism is an instrument of spiritual war. Have you ever thought about baptism that way? What you're saying is, is I'm choosing which side I'm on. And I'm making it public. Because I want people to know. This is what has happened in my heart. John chapter 3 talks about how you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. There's no other way. There's no other way. And he says, what are you talking about? How can you be born again? And Jesus says, if I tell you earthly things and you can't understand, how are you going to understand spiritual things? You're not going to. You're not going to. It doesn't make sense. But you must be born again. And the only way you can do that is for you to ask Jesus Christ to save you from the punishment of your sins and allow you to spend eternity with him. And that's it. That's the only way. But once that's done, he expects you to take sides. He expects you to take sides. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. I pray that I, pray that I didn't waste a moment or a word. I pray specifically that it did not fall on deaf ears. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts, open our eyes spiritually, help us to see that there is only one way to be saved. And that is you gave us your son that we celebrate on this day in the manger with the sole purpose of dying on that cross for our sins, being buried in the tomb, and resurrected on the third day for us. There was no other way it could happen. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for loving us in spite of ourselves. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, for giving us what we don't deserve, and for not giving us what we do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Please, God. Save those that aren't saved here tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.